Okay, so here's where we left off. This is the last section we'll do today, but it will take a little bit of time because we're going to take that trapezoid rule and we're going to try Richardson's uh, methods or his thinking and we're going to be applying the Taylor series to try to figure out if we can find out how much error is in the trapezoid rule and then help have Richardson help us get rid of it. Okay, so let's just go back to our trapezoidal integration again. This is the one that's fairly straightforward. And so we're, we're going to now be moving from this previous notation of S sub T. I think, I think there was a subscript here. It was actually S sub T. And we are going to take that and put it in the first column of some array, and we're going to call the array R. So if you imagine going back to our recursive trapezoid rule, and, and you do that horrible macro step where you take the whole interval and you make one giant trapezoid, we would have called that S sub T of zero. And then when you cut the thing in half, and, and you did that nice little uh, tricky combination so you didn't waste calculations, the result would have been S sub T of 1. And then you cut it in half again, and it's S sub T of 2. And you load that up on the leftmost column of an array called R. The upper left-hand corner we'll call R of 0, 0. And it will simply be the trapezoid rule applied to the whole interval. Now what you'll do is take the next point down in the column, and you'll take the old macro, this this huge uh, uh, trapezoid rule, and just pick up the one point it's missing if you went to a three-point rule. And you will reevaluate that and add it to what you had before, and you're going to get R of 1, 0. So, so far we have done nothing different than what you already coded up in your recursive trapezoid rule. And you keep going. Okay, now your book does it a little differently than I do it. What your book does is it says, well, that was so much fun. Let's just go ahead and keep doing the, uh, the, the recursive trapezoid rule and fill up R2 of, R of 0, R3 of 0, R4 of 0 until we feel like stopping. And there's where I don't like it because the only stopping rule you have is looking at the relative error on the trapezoid rule column, which we already know isn't as good as we could do with a Simpsons rule or something better. I will end up creating a new value, which will be called R of 0, 1. So this is the upper left-hand corner, R of 0, 0. The R of 1, 0 is going to be the next row down, but still in the first column. And we want to build now an R of actually 1, 1, which will take advantage of a linear combination of the two values I already had. If you look down below, uh, what that is going to be, regardless on how many recursion levels we, we use, is it's going to be our Simpsons rule. Uh, at least it will be equivalent to the Simpsons rule. Uh, what we're going to be doing is getting rid of the, the highest order error on the trapezoid rule, and uh, we're ending up building a Simpson equivalent by doing this linear combination. Now, if we can do it for columns one and two, why couldn't we build a third column, which, again, takes another higher order Richardson's approach and attacks the next term on the, on the uh, error term on the trapezoid rule and build a yet more powerful rule than Simpson? So here's our R of 0, 0 position. When you're writing your algorithm, just go ahead and calculate the, the, the top level trapezoid rule over the whole interval, and then use... Uh, the next term to get the three points in there, the midpoint and the two endpoints. So the A plus H over 2 is that midpoint. Okay, now if you go back and look at a Taylor expansion for this integral, the Taylor rule applies to any function with continuous derivatives. And the integral is just as good a function as any others. So we should be able to write down a... a Taylor expansion in terms of powers of h uh, that involve the linear term as our predictor and all other sources on the Taylor, Taylor expansion as sources of error. Now I'm calling the coefficients a2 and a3 and we could go out and calculate these constants but we just don't want to so we're going to call them a2 and a3. Okay. Now I could do the same thing 
with the slightly more accurate uh, calculation, this next recursion level down, which used half the interval space. And we already calculated, we've already got it called R of 1, so I could calculate a, uh, an error term, but my H's that I'm putting in there are half the width as they were for the first one. So the H squared term really becomes an H squared, or H over 2 squared, and uh, so that's the same as H squared over 4. Or the h cubed term, I'm really sticking an h over 2 inside of that, and that becomes h cubed over 2 cubed, and 2 cubed is 8. I can now take a linear combination, just like I did with the Richardson's approach, that is designed to get rid of the h squared term, because that's the biggest uh, source of error that I've got in either of these two integrals. So just like I did with the Richardson's method, I can take the first integral expression and subtract, this, subtract 4 times the second integral expression. And when I do that, the h squared term goes away. It just gets subtracted out. And the next term is h cubed. We just write that out the long way. And so I'm just highlighting on the next sheet where those two terms are that are going to cancel. And that means that the, uh, the integral uh, is going to be equal to some linear combination of these two uh, elements in my R matrix, plus now a order of H cubed term. Now, I've got a little side note on there that that turns out to be order of H to the fourth. And it's a happy accident. I'm not going to try to uh, prove that. But one of the reasons why Simpson's rule did so much better than the trapezoid rule is we got lucky. And when we aimed at trying to get rid of the h squared term, uh, the h cubed term went with it. And what I didn't show you, but we could have, is even though I was just trying to make Simpson's rule perfect for the constant, the linear term, and the quadratic term, it turns out if I tested it on the cube, if I tried it on x cubed, it would give you an exact result on x cubed, the integral of x cubed, even though I didn't really ask it to. It wasn't part of the design. It just came out that way. So that means we now have minus 3 times the integral we want is a linear combination of r of 0, 0 and r of 1, 0. Divide both sides by minus 3, and you'll end up getting a predictor of 4 thirds r of 1, 0 minus 1 third r of 0, 0. Now, if you can do that on the first two entries, if I just go back a slide for a minute, uh, we, only, we only produced r of 0, 0 and r of 1, 0, and what we just calculated is going to be called r of 1, 1. There's no reason why we couldn't have done exactly the same thing in a third row. We could have used our standard uh, trapezoidal recursive rule to get an r of 2, 0. So build yet one more value in that first column. Uh, if we did that, then we would have another two values to work with, and we could apply the same, uh, the same idea, uh, except instead of using r of 1, 0, and r of 0, 0, we could use r of 2, 0, and r of 1, 0 in the same manner. And the coefficients would have to be exactly the same. And we would call the result r of 2, 1. We could merrily go down and continue to add values in the first column and the second column of this R matrix. But, uh, you know, from that homework that we just looked at, it seems that Richardson's rule could be used again. So we could, we could yet aim at the next highest order uh, uh, of the Taylor expansion of the error and do another linear combination. And that's what Romberg's integration is all about. It's applying the Richardson's method to the extreme, the Romberg integration by doing that Richardson's approach comes up with a very easy to execute uh, uh, iterative or recursive approach, depending on how you want to write it, uh, way to deal with that R matrix so you can build it like a big triangle. So, so this becomes our, our formula. The M is going to be our column position on the R matrix, and the N is going to be the row position on the R matrix. And you just build it as you go. Now, like I said, your book wants you to build the first column and then build the second column and then the third column 
I don't like that, and then I didn't give you a homework assignment to work it that way. If you look at the algorithms in the book, it does it column by column, and that's not the approach that I want you to take in the homework. You're going to build this thing like a triangle. Uh, come get the first two values at the top of that matrix and then move to the right one column and make yourself a little three-point triangle. Then move down one more row and you'll end up making the triangle a six-point triangle because you fill in the, as the next row. And just keep building it as a triangle. You're only going to be building a lower triangular matrix. Everything above the diagonal you won't need or use. It's a two-step process. You're going to go back and forth between this formula here and the formula down there to be able to build this triangle. Okay, and then I want you to calculate the relative error. Well, which relative error? You could be calculating the relative error of the last two points of the, of the first column if you wanted to. In fact, I will want you to do that. If you do that, you should get exactly the same result as you did with the recursive trapezoid rule we did in homework 5.1. So every time you add a new row to this matrix R, you can calculate one more relative error. So you have a lot of choices here on which result you want. When we get to your homework, I will really just have you do a few relative errors. I'm going to want you to do uh, the trapezoid coming straight down, and then I'll want you to be going down the diagonal and, and give me a relative error like the one that's shown here. So that brings us then to another homework. And, and so we're going to integrate the exact same function that we're using. And I want you to build that triangular matrix as you go uh, by doing the first column in the normal, uh, the exact same code you did the recursive trapezoid rule with. But don't run all the way down that column. To, you know, stop it as you get down to two points and then calculate the next position to the right and then continue with that trapezoid rule as you keep building uh, downward and keep working across to build the whole uh, matrix uh, in a triangle. I'm going to have you do the relative error in two ways. I'll use the two diagonal entries like we talked about on the previous page. I want you to iterate, however, until the exact relative error gets below 10 to the minus 12. Uh, so take a look at those errors and comment on them. In particular, the number of iterations it takes uh, for the, the uh, recursive trapezoid rule to get to 10 to the minus 4th error, the Simpsons rule to get you to 10 to the minus 8th error, and this new requirement of 10 to the minus 12th, and beware of the text on the on page 219. If you use that as an example, you're not going to get much credit because that's the one where they go down to the first column until they feel like stopping, and that isn't the way we want to do the homework. On 5.4, we're skipping it. It's, it's a nice section. It, it's a nice theoretical section, uh, but the practical part of this chapter is 5.1 to 5.3, and besides... I want to give you guys a chance to work on it and then and spend the rest of the course on differential equations.